Peru in Indiana is known as the circus capital of the world, it has been home to the Peru Amateur Circus since 1960. Each summer for eight days during the third week of July, 200 young people put on a show that transforms the town of about 11,000 residents into a spectacular festival, culminating with the Circus Heritage Parade. All of the performers are amateurs, ranging in age from 7 to 21 years. Peru was also the winter headquarters for several famous circuses, including Ringling Brothers, Higginbeck Wallace, Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show and others. Ben Wallace first brought his circus to the town in the late 1800s. He was followed by scores of traveling shows that established winter headquarters just southeast of Peru. The city was once so ubiquitous with the performances that in the 1920s, Peru became known on maps as the Circus City. But by the 1940s the circuses no longer wintered in Peru, favoring instead Florida. Peru is also the home of the world's only remaining manufacturer of steam calliopes. A calliope is a musical instrument that produces sound by sending steam through large whistles, originally locomotive whistles. It's also known as a steam organ. Circus calliopes were mounted on a carved, painted and gilded wagon pulled by horses. In my previous video I addressed the possibility of a pedophile ring involving father and son clients centered in the Kokomo area, in this video I also include Peru and adjacent areas to this pedophile ring and go through people from these areas who have the potential to be involved in such a ring. There are probably a lot of people in this ring because through the arrest of Keegan Klein, a drop box pedophilia ring was revealed which in Indiana may have had over 900 members. Delphi teens Abigail Williams and Liberty German. Abby and Libby were murdered after going for a hike on February 13, 2017. Their bodies were discovered next day near the Monin High Bridge Trail. Authorities have released two crime scene sketches of a possible suspect, one in which he looks far younger than the other. They also released Snapchat video from Libby's phone of a man walking on the Monin High Bridge toward the girls saying, down the hill before they were killed. Liberty German and the other underage girls who communicated with the Anthony Schatz profile thought they were communicating with a handsome successful model unaware that behind the fictitious model facade was Keegan Anthony Klein. The former fashion model Vince Kowalski is a patrol officer for the Ketchikan Police Department in Alaska. He was shocked to find out that the fake Anthony underscore Schatz profile had misused his photos to commit horrible crimes against children thousands of miles from where he lives. As a father of two girls, he was very heartbroken to hear what had happened to Abby and Libby. The cop confirmed he had been in contact with Indiana State Police about Keegan Anthony Klein's misuse of his model images to catfish underage girls to solicit nude images, obtain their addresses and attempt to meet them. This is not the first time Kowalski's photos have been used to create a fake online profile as his photos have been used to create fake online dating profiles as well. Seven days after the murders of Abby and Libby, the Anthony Schatz profile reportedly asked a 12-year-old girl in Galveston for her address to possibly meet her, the girl gave her address and the day after when she got off her school bus in front of her home, she saw a man outside the house with ski mask peeping into her bedroom window. The man could not be Keegan or Tony Klein because they had gone to Las Vegas the same day, moreover Keegan knew the girl and her family and had visited her home. Countless times and had sleepovers there as her brother was his classmate and close friend from his middle school days, therefore he would not need to ask the girl for address, this suggests involvement of an another man in the pedophilia ring who also used the Anthony Schatz profile, he may have intended to sexually attack the underage girl if she had been in her bedroom or kidnap her. 
but his attempt was botched when the girl turned out not to be in the house and he was spotted before he had entered the house. Is it possible that the ski mask man was James Brian Chadwell who at the time resided in Kokomo, which is very close to Galveston? On April 19, 2021 Chadwell had used his pet dogs to lure a nine-year-old neighbor girl into his apartment in Lafayette before he kidnapped, molested, and attempted to murder her. The Galveston ski mask man incident caused the police to take an interest in Keegan Klein for the first time and on February 25, 2017 police raided the Klein's home in Peru shortly after Tony and Keegan had returned from a four-day trip to Las Vegas. The police found over 100 photos and videos of underage girls on several electronic devices. This led to the charges against Keegan and the start of the winding up of the pedophilia ring which he was a member of. Keegan Klein has over the years lived several times in Galveston with his mother, latest in 2019. His mother had then recently married a hog farmer there who offered Keegan a job and stay at his hog farm which Keegan accepted and he became an experienced hog farmhand. Shortly after the Delphi murders, Keegan and his father went to Las Vegas. He and his father didn't go to the Moonlight Bunny Ranch brothel as they had planned, as it was way too expensive, $400 an hour and too far away in the unincorporated community of Mount House they instead contacted escort services but they also cost too much, $250. Keegan went to Las Vegas in June 2017 to change his life. He made extensive searches about the Delphi case when in Las Vegas. Keegan smoked a lot of weed, PCP, LSD and mushrooms with his friend there, but had to return to Peru, Indiana as everything was so expensive in Las Vegas and he had a falling out with his Las Vegas friend over money. According to leaks and theories, shortly before the murders of Abby and Libby, Keegan Klein and the Fetophile Rings killer team including Richard Allen likely met at the Marathon gas station in Delphi to start the operation from there. Keegan Lickley brought with him one or two accomplices from Peru or Kokomo in his father's red Rubicon Jeep, perhaps his father Tony was one of the accomplices present. Keegan had just succeeded in luring Abby and Libby out to the Monon High Bridge on behalf of the pedophilia ring and now it was the killer team's turn to carry out the sexual sadistic slaughter of the two girls. It is possible that the old farmer Ronald Logan assisted in the attack. Richard Allen and his companions brought with them action cameras and phones to record the murders of the two girls, as well as other equipment for use in the attack such as pistols, knives and a spare set of clothes to change to if their clothes were sprayed with blood spatter from the victims. Richard Allen parked his Ford Focus 2016 model at the abandoned Child Protection Service building and walked towards the target area alone, he came in from a sidewalk just in front of the east side of the Freedom Bridge there he came across three juvenile girls that came from the Monon High Bridge, the girls said hey to Richard but he was unresponsive and hid his face so the girls found him spooky. Witnesses said that Richard walked purposefully on his way to the Monon High Bridge. As he had been informed by Keegan Klein or Ronald Logan that Libby and Abby had arrived at the bridge. The other members of the kill team may have taken a separate route to the target area, maybe they parked at the Delphi Cemetery and entered the target area from there or if Logan was involved park it at his farm and entered the target area from there, these members may never have walked the bridge but placed themselves below next to the creek waiting for Richard to chase the prey down to them. When he arrived at the bridge, Richard observed the two girls impatiently waiting for the bait Anthony Shorts to appear. Now that Keegan had served the girls on a platter to Richard and his accomplices, they stuck with ruthless and brutal efficiency much to the satisfaction of the ring. Richard took control over the two girls by threatening them with his Sig Sauer P226 SW40 caliber pistol. Richard left an unused cartridge from his pistol at the murder site between the bodies of Libby and Abby. A lady exercising at the Monon High Bridge area saw Richard standing on one of the bridge platforms, she also saw Abby and Libby on the bridge, later she saw Richard Allen again on the trail leaving the area in the direction of the Freedom Bridge, his clothes were muddy and bloody, she thought he had been in a fight. After the crime was committed, Keegan likely picked up one or more of the accomplices in his father's red jeep and possibly also took the murder knife, along with other evidence. As well as the bloody clothes that the murderer had discarded, 
Keegan returned to Peru, he drove to the railroad bridge over the Wabash River in Peru and likely tossed the murder knife and a phone into the river, but burned flammable evidence like the bloody clothes in his grandpa Jerry's burn pit. It is no random coincidence that two weeks after they ended the search in the Wabash River in Peru and the burn pit searches at the property of Keegan's grandpa Jerry Klein. On October 13, 2022, Investigators interviewed Richard Matthew Allen and executed a search warrant at his home on North Whiteman Drive in Delphi, where they found knives and firearms, including a Sig Sauer Model P226 pistol. Then they arrested him on October 26. On October 31, Indiana State Police charged him with murder of Abby and Libby, he pleaded not guilty to the charges. Indiana State Police carried out a five-week search from August 19 to September 28, 2022 of the Wabash River in Peru, Indiana. Sources told that the Wabash River search was connected to Keegan Klein and to the murders of Abby and Libby in Delphi. The same day the search began on August 19, a court allowed state police to take custody of Klein under a sealed order. The search of the Wabash River in Peru started near the Nickel Plate Trail Bridge and extended west past the US-31 bridge. Metal detectors were used but the lion's share of the search was conducted by hand, the search team collected a pile of metal and other objects under the bridge. Klein's father Tony lives just a short distance from the bridge. When people stopped by his house to ask him if he knew anything about the search and why state police took temporary custody of his son from the Miami County Jail, Tony Klein didn't come to the door. In two August 2022 court filings, Keegan Klein explored different legal options and negotiated with the prosecutor. The Marathon gas station staff gave their surveillance camera hard drive to the FBI, but there were technical issues so FBI messed it up when trying to retrieve footage from the hard drive and likely destroyed the footage so FBI was never able to check if father and son Klein, Richard Allen and others in the assumed kill team were present at the Marathon gas station shortly before the murders of Abby and Libby. A purple Chrysler PT Cruiser was seen parked at the abandoned CPS building at the time Abby and Libby were in the trail area, Tony's mom is said to have owned such a car at the time. If it was her car and if he is involved, it is possible that Tony had borrowed his mother's car to use it in the transport of Abby and Libby to Peru after they had been kidnapped. If two cars belonging to the Klein family, the Rubicon Jeep and PT Cruiser were used in the kidnap attempt of Abby and Libby. Tony may have participated as driver of one of the two cars. Keegan doesn't drive as he doesn't have a driver's license and was only a passenger in the Rubicon Jeep. After the botched kidnap attempt that ended with the murders of Abby and Libby, Keegan visited his grandparents with his father between 5 to 6 p.m. likely to deliver back grandma's PT cruiser and get rid of evidence from the murders by burning it in grandpa's burn pit. After examining Richard Allen's pistol and the 40mm cartridge found between the bodies of Abby and Libby, the prosecution came to the conclusion that the unspent cartridge had been ejected from his gun's cartridge magazine as extraction marks on the cartridge are unique to that specific magazine, but gun experts asked by media aren't so sure and doubt the solidity of magazine cartridge markings as a forensic evidence. During the forensic investigations at the scene of the murders of Abby and Libby, hair from pets was found which may originate from the killer or those who assisted him, in the pictures here we see Keegan Klein with the family dog when it was a puppy, Richard Allen sharing bed with his pet cat and James Brian Chadwell with one of his dogs. Keegan Klein's dog was said to have been taken in for examination by the police, Chadwell's dogs have probably been thoroughly examined by the police. After he used one of them to attack the nine-year-old girl he molested and tried to kill. If hairs from the crime scene originates from the Klein dog, it would indicate that Keegan or Tony had been at the crime scene, because the dog could not have gone there by itself all the way from Peru. Alan's cat, on the other hand, which lived near the Monan High Bridge, may have gone there on its own to hunt for small rodents and if police have found hairs from Richard Allen's pet cat Ozzy at the crime scene, it can be explained by the fact that Ozzy may have roamed on its own to the Monan High Bridge area and Ronald Logan's property to hunt for small game. Ozzy died of cancer in August 2018. The Allen family buried Ozzy the cat in their backyard. Police allegedly exhumed Ozzy's remains in October 2022.
According to his own statement, Keegan Klein has mental problems and anxiety, which may have been the reason why he didn't get any education and a permanent job, as well as making him completely dependent on his father. It is possible that Tony Klein only to a lesser extent or not at all has been involved in the pedophilia ring his son was involved in and thus has nothing to do with the murders of Abby and Libby, as six years after the murders, the police have still not charged and arrested Tony Klein in this case. Jerry Klein obituary, Jerry Leroy Klein, 76, of Peru, passed away at his residence at 6.30 a.m. on Friday, February 18, 2022. Born on November 24, 1945, in Peru, Indiana, he was the son of Richard and Betty L. Sipe Klein, he married Linda Leah Trexler on June 5, 1965 in Logansport, Indiana. He was baptized at the Mexico Baptist Church in Mexico Town where Richard Matthew Allen grew up, Jerry attended Olive Branch Church of God for several years. He graduated from Peru High School in 1964 and worked for many years at the Chrysler Corporation in Kokomo. He enjoyed old cars and motorcycles and loved going to car shows, traveling and spending winters in Panama City Beach, Florida. Family was important to Jerry, Keegan Klein, and his other grandchildren were among his greatest joys in life. Along with his wife, Linda Klein in Peru, he is survived by two children, Michelle L. Brian Burns in Macy and Jerry A. Klein also known as Tony Klein in Peru, three grandchildren, Jared Kayla Wilkinson. Sister-in-law, Carol Trexler. Funeral services was held at 2 p.m. on Wednesday, February 23, 2022, at McLean Funeral Home in Denver Town, with Pastor Kyle Schnitz officiating. Jerry was buried in Emmy Hope Cemetery, Peru. Memorial contributions could be made to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. A relative of Keegan Klein was taken into custody in September 2022. Travis Trexler, a cousin of Tony Klein, was arrested in Wabash County on driving a motor vehicle under the influence of alcohol or recreational drugs charges. Trexler was held in custody for a week in place of a $1,200 bond. He was released on September 8, 2022 court records show. The 39-year-old was also arrested in September 2015 on a warrant for driving a vehicle while intoxicated with a controlled substance. He was also charged with similar offenses in November 2021. Trexler's arrest came as Indiana State Police announced they'd concluded a five-week-long search along the Wabash River in Peru, likely linked to the 2017 murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. On his way to the Monon High Bridge to watch fish, Richard Allen said he didn't notice people around him as he was busy with his phone following the stock exchange on the stock sticker. Despite both witnesses and himself placing Richard Allen at 2.13 p.m. on the Monon High Bridge at the time Abby and Libby were kidnapped from the bridge by the bridge guy, Richard Allen claims that he is not the one who kidnapped and killed the girls, he claims that he did not see anything of the two girls on the bridge or in the trail area and says that all his attention was focused on looking for fish in Deer Creek from Platform 1. Several on social media from the area say, it is very limited what one can see of fish activities in Deer Creek from that distance, but it is possible Richard Allen used hands-free binocular glasses for fish watching. Ronald Logan also used fish watching as an alibi for that afternoon, but he went to Aquarium World Shop in Lafayette to watch fish. Shortly after the murders of Abby and Libby, Richard Allen contacted a conservation officer, protector of wildlife and the environment. Allen met him in a store and told him he had been at the Monon High Bridge between 1.30 p.m. and 3.30 p.m. at the day of the murders to watch fish in Deer Creek. While there, he had not seen Abby and Libby nor anyone else. But he had met three juvenile girls close to the Freedom Bridge on his way to the Monon High Bridge. Police interrogated Richard Allen and took with them a large number of Richard's belongings to be examined by forensic specialists. Two weeks after the searches at Richard's home, he was arrested on October 28 for the murders of Abby and Libby. It is therefore no coincidence that Keegan Klein as Anthony Schatz had arranged to meet Liberty the same day she was murdered allegedly by Richard Allen and a team supporting him. 
Richard Allen has also worked in Peru as he in 2017 was recognized by a female former fellow student from North Miami High School when he was at work at CVS Pharmacy in Peru. On social media many have speculated that Richard Allen was attracted to Libby as a prey because of her likeness to his own daughter Brittany and wife Kathy. He may have selected her for the attention of the pedophile ring, that in turn catfished her and lured her and Abby into a death trap on the Monan High Bridge. Richard came in from a sideway just at the east side of the Freedom Bridge when he came across three juvenile girls on their way to enter the bridge, they had left the Monan High Bridge. Just before Abby and Libby arrived there, the tree girls described Richard as a creepy guy that hid his face and didn't respond when they said hey to him, he showed no interest for the girls and walked purposefully because he was focused on Libby, it was also therefore he hid his face for the three girls and had parked his car in such a way at the CPS building so the license plates were hidden for passers-by. These preparations prove that he was not a random killer, if so, Richard would have been. Satisfied with the three girls as prey and attacked them instead. But he was a targeted killer, a fetophile hitman after Libby. He knew in advance that Abby and Libby were present at the Monan High Bridge and the only person that may have provided him with that information was Keegan Klein and his ring, without their support, he could not know that Libby was on Brittany Allen Zapanta's husband Paolo Zapanta is from Bacoor, Cavita in the Philippines. He is June Para Zapanta and Marisol Bernardo Zapanta's son and has four siblings. He lived in Winnipeg, Canada before moving to Goshen in Indiana, U.S. He later moved to Napanee in Indiana. On November 11, 2017, he and the two years younger Brittany got married. In May 2019, he was one of the Q1 2019 recipients of the inaugural Bright Ideas Award of Optronics International, a vehicle lighting manufacturer with facilities in Indiana and Oklahoma, USA. He was 30 years old when his parents and siblings visited him and Brittany in Napanee on September 19, 2022. Roger Mark Gorham was born on September 4, 1951, in Wabash, Indiana where he lived most of his life before moving with his wife to Aiken in South Carolina in 2004 where he died on August 26, 2014.
He was a capable musician who sang, played harmonica and guitar in the genre of American folk music. He started a YouTube channel with his music videos shortly before he died. Recitation of Roger Gorham's company profile from January 2002, visionary entrepreneur in Aiken, South Carolina, USA. Owner of RMG Rigging Service, LLC that was incorporated in 2002, has attained and preserved an excellent reputation in the field of industrial machine rigging and industrial millwright work. If you have heavy equipment and machinery to move, RMG Rigging Service can provide you with timely service with the assurance that your equipment will reach its destination. We believe in doing volume work to lower costs for our customers. Education, Wabash Graphic and Doctor of Philosophy, Music Theory and Composition from 1967 to 1969 at Wabash High School. Obituary of Mr. Roger Mark Gorham, 63, Beloved husband of Mrs. Julie Mix Gorham, he died suddenly on Tuesday, August 26, 2014, at his home in Aiken, South Carolina. Born in and a resident of Wabash, Indiana, until 10 years ago, he was a son of the late Robert and Joyce Armstrong Gorham. He was the owner of RMG Rigging, LLC. Roger was an accomplished musician who had made several albums. He enjoyed being with his family and friends, singing and playing his guitar and harmonica. In addition to his wife and parents, family members include his children, Rick Allen, Delphi, Indiana, Mark, Cynthia, Gorham, LaFontaine, Indiana, Jamie Gorham, Aiken, South Carolina, Alex Gorham, Spartanburg, South Carolina and Robbie, Miranda, Gorham, Windsor, South Carolina, stepsons, Jason and Jeffrey. Brittany, Jan, both of Aiken, South Carolina, siblings, Robin, Loretta, and Larry, Paula, Gorham, both of Aiken, South Carolina and the late Mitch Gorham and six grandchildren. In accordance with his wishes, Roger was cremated and the family held a celebration of life service at a later date. If so desired, memorials could be made to Shriners Hospitals for Children. Jordan Arine Sofer, Born on March 24, 1988, was 18 years old the day she went missing in Wabash, Indiana, on May 23, 2006. Originally from Peru, Indiana, Jordan Sofer, formerly known as Aaron Willis, was adopted in 2002 by her foster parents Robert and Linda Sofer in Wabash. On the 1st of April, Jordan Sofer moved in with the Glenn McClemens family on Sivy Street. On Sunday she left the McClemens home to stay with a friend and co-worker Aaron Harlan, whom she worked with at Hardee's. The Sofers reported to police on Wednesday that their daughter had gone missing. She hadn't called or showed up for work. The police then spoke to Aaron Harlan who said she had last seen Jordan Sofer on Tuesday at 5.15 a.m. When Harlan returned from work Sofer was gone, but her purse and cell phone were still there. According to Robert Sofer, Jordan Sofer arrived at his home in a truck driven by Corey Brydenthal who dropped her off and left. Robert and his daughter spoke briefly in the garage. She told him she loved him, gave him a hug and said see you later. Robert was the last person that saw her. Brydenthal said after he left he noticed Sofer's cell phone was laying on his seat, so he went to Hardee's to return it. She wasn't at work so he gave the phone to Iron Harlan. There was no activity in Soper's bank account after she disappeared. Jordan Sofer was 5 feet, 1 inch in height. She had brown hair, brown eyes and was about 120 pounds. Jordan Orion Sofer's partial skeletal remains scattered in dense brush along a creek in Miami County, Indiana. Her body had apparently been there since around the time of her disappearance. Authorities have been unable to determine the cause of death due to the deterioration of the remains. Richard Matthew Allen's biological father, the late musician Roger Mark Gorham, lived in East Hill Street in Wabash, two minutes from 215 East Hill Street Apartment 3, where Jordan Orion Sofer stayed with her friend Aaron Harlan the day she disappeared. One can speculate that Richard Allen while visiting his father in Wabash came across Jordan Sofer in East Hill Street and abducted her to a secluded forested site in Peru where she perhaps was murdered in the same way as Abby and Libby. In May 2009, Jordan Sofer's skeletal remains were found spread along a creek in a wooded area, 
overgrown with vegetation in Peru, Indiana. James Brian Chadwell, Ronald Rogan and Richard Allen were all heavy drinkers who lived in the same area, so it is not unlikely that they may have gotten to know each other in one of the bars in Delphi or Lafayette and later have been invited to Logan's farm to have drunk parties. Both Allen and Chadwell were outdoorsmen and Chadwell was enthusiastic about railroad bridges, which is why the Monon High Bridge area must have been alluring to them. There are several ways Keegan Klein could have got to know Ronald Logan, James Brian Chadwell and Richard Allen, one way is that Keegan Klein with experience as a farm worker on a p could have applied for a job as a seasonal farmhand on Ronald Logan's farm, or that his father Tony met Chadwell through his job at Chrysler Transmission, because in 2017 James Brian Chadwell lived in Kokomo and as an autoworker and welder by trade, we can assume he worked there. Chadwell may also have become acquainted with the Kleins in Peru City where he lived many times, latest in 2020 and where he had his family. A call placed using Logan's cell phone produced cell tower data that shows Logan's cell phone appears to be in or around his property on February 13, 2017 at 2.09 p.m. Although his exact location cannot be confirmed, the tower data shows that Logan's cell phone was in the area of the Monon High Bridge Trail. If the intention was to kill and then leave Abby and Libby on Ronald Logan's property, it is unlikely that he had anything to do with the murders because he would have understood that this would get him into a lot of trouble both with the police, the judiciary, and the media, but if the plan was to kidnap the girls to take them somewhere in Howard or Miami counties, then it is possible that Logan was part of the ring and the team. But after the girls had been brought to his property Libby May have resisted so vigorously that the kidnapping could not be carried out, with the situation out of control, Richard Allen and his accomplices killed the girls and left them on the spot. When Logan's farm was searched, the police found an entire arsenal of firearms and hunting knives in his house. Logan was also known as a drunkard and had been convicted repeatedly of drunk driving. Logan was also known to abuse women he had relationships with. Two women he had relationships with before. The murders of Abby and Libby, told of a brutal man. One woman said that Logan had dragged her by the hair out of his car and threatened and scolded her, saying that if he killed her he would hide the body so well that it would never be found by anyone, a younger single mother he had relationship with, told that Logan had punched her hard in the face at his home and threatened her because he believed she had offended him. This woman told her ex-husband that if she was found murdered Logan would be the killer. On the morning of February 14, 2017 prior to the discovery of Abby and Libby's bodies, Ronald Logan called and asked his cousin for a false alibi by telling the police that he had been with Ronald Logan that day and drove him to Aquarium World in Lafayette. The cousin accepted and gave a false alibi for Ronald when he was questioned by the police on March 7, 2017, on March 9 he was questioned again and then he regretted and admitted that he had lied and given a false alibi for Ronald. A receipt from Aquarium World in Lafayette dated February 13, 2017 with a checkout time 5.21 p.m. was found in Logan's home on March 6, 2017, during a probation violation search. Logan resided approximately 22 miles from the store. It would take approximately 30 minutes to get to the store from Logan's home. At 2.09 p.m. on February 13, 2017 Ronald Logan made a call from his property and four minutes later Richard Matthew Allen allegedly attacked and kidnapped Abby and Libby nearby. By his call, did Ronald Logan give the go-ahead signal to Richard Matthew Allen and his accomplices to attack Abby and Libby? Shortly after his call, the two girls were killed on his property. Burner is a mobile application that allows users to create temporary disposable phone numbers. The app allows smartphone users to have a phone number that is anonymous and can be thrown away. If he is the killer, Richard Matthew Allen and his accomplices likely used burner phones to evade detection by the authorities and after killing Abby and Libby they handed their burner phones to Klein so he could toss them into the Wabash River. To protect their identity, Richard Matthew Allen and accomplices could also have procured SIM cards that weren't linked to their real identity, that is a burner SIM, a cheap, prepaid SIM card that the they would insert into another phone to switch between numbers for contacts between the members of the pedophile ring in preparation of the kidnapping operation of Abby and Libby. 
They could use a secure messaging service like Signal or Telegram not to disclose their primary phone numbers. To protect their identity, Richard Matthew Allen and accomplices could also have procured SIM cards that weren't linked to their real identity, that is a burner SIM, a cheap, prepaid SIM card that the they would insert into another phone to switch between numbers for contacts between the members of the pedophile ring in preparation of the kidnapping operation of Abby and Libby. They could use a secure messaging service like Signal or Telegram not to disclose their primary phone numbers. Police showed a strong interest in Ronald Logan shortly after the 2017 murders of Abby and Libby, which led to searches of his home, as well as an arrest, conviction and prison sentence for a parole violation in another case. Since then, the Carroll County Sheriff's Office, the Indiana State Police and the FBI have no longer shown any interest in Ronald Logan in connection with the Delphi murders. It may indicate that Ronald Logan had nothing to do with the murders of Abby and Libby. A nine-year-old girl came to the 42-year-old James Brian Chadwell's door in Lafayette, Indiana on April 19, 2021 asking to pet a dog. He let her into his house and almost immediately savagely attacked her until she was unconscious. He carried the child to the basement where she regained consciousness to find herself naked and in pain, and then Chadwell began sexually assaulting her. Chadwell stopped his sexual assault, locked the girl in his basement and went outside where he saw the girl's grandmother hollering for the girl. He goes to the grandmother, consoles her, rubs her shoulder and assuring her it's going to be okay. Chadwell then returned to his home at 714 Park Avenue to continue his victimization of the girl. Officers were dispatched regarding a missing child report near Park Avenue in Lafayette searching the neighborhood. When officers looking for the girl knocked on his door, he was shirtless and told them the girl came over, petted his dog then headed off in a specific direction. Should I get dressed and come and look for her, Chadwell asked. Ten minutes after the officer's first contact with Chadwell, they knocked on his door again, but he didn't answer. Fifteen minutes after, the officers knocked a third time, he answered and they asked him for permission to check his residence. He allowed them in to search his house, his television was blaring the screams and noises of a horror show, but the real horror was in the basement. The officers checked the basement, which they said was secured with a chain lock. There they found a young girl who was visibly distraught and crying, with her clothing on the floor beside her. She was identified as the missing girl and said Chadwell tried to kill her. She was injured and taken to the hospital for treatment. The girl described going into Chadwell's residence and petting his dogs. While inside the home, Chadwell attacked her and punset her in the head multiple times and commanded his pit bull to bite her because she was fighting back, Chadwell also choked her with his hands and also using his arm in a headlock to the point where she passed out. She said most of her clothes were off when she regained consciousness and Chadwell took her into the basement. He attempted to have sexual intercourse with her and then forced her to perform oral sex on him. At one point, Chadwell got dressed to go answer the door and then the police went in and found her. Across her neck were lateral strangulation marks, and she had broken blood vessels with black eyes, bruising to her head, arms, legs and bite marks, the girl also had a dog bite. She was hospitalized in Riley Hospital for children that week, including on her 10th birthday. In Lafayette, Indiana, Tippecanoe Superior 2 Judge Stephen Meyer described James Brian Chadwell as a monster, then sentenced to him to a 90-year prison sentence for his very brutal attack on the nine-year-old girl. Chadwell nodded his head slightly and glanced down. The self-confessed 42-year-old child molester and attempted murderer must serve 71 years of that 90-year sentence before he is eligible for release. If he lives that long, Chadwell will be 113 years old and the year will be 2092. Chadwell, who pleaded guilty on October 22 without a plea agreement, made a few statements before sentencing, acknowledging his horrific deeds, saying he did not know from where his behavior came. This is not who I am, not who I was raised to be, I never wanted to hurt anybody, especially a little girl, I'm genuinely sorry and I don't plan to appeal my sentence, Chadwell said. It took approximately a one-minute walk from the victim's home to James Brian Chadwell's home at 714 Park Avenue in Lafayette.
When the police found the nine-year-old girl, she was naked and had extensive bruising from a pit bull terrier bite. Prosecutor Harrington said police body cam footage of the rescue was so graphic most people who observed it sought mental health treatment. James Brian Chadwell, lost a fight on May 7, 2021 inside his jail cell in Tippecanoe County Jail in Lafayette, Indiana according to Tippecanoe County Sheriff's Office. Chadwell, 42, and another inmate, Quinton Jackson Jr. 25, got into a fight Wednesday evening. Chadwell received minor injuries to his face and was treated by the jail medical staff. He was convicted in Cass County, Indiana for receiving stolen property on June 9, 2016. In August 2016, he violated probation. In November 2016, he was taken to jail and held without bond, but a few days later he was released, a hearing was scheduled for April 2017 in the case. He had an ongoing court case in 2017 for receiving stolen property in probation violation, at the time his address was given as Kokomo, Indiana. That's about 34 miles from Delphi. He was convicted of drunk driving with a prior conviction and resisting law enforcement in February 2020, he received a 365-day jail term and his probation was revoked in Miami County. In October 2020, he was convicted of criminal trespass and criminal mischief while still on probation, he received a 90-day jail sentence. In February 2020, his father filed a notice of claim to evict him from his home in Peru. Here Chadwell tells about two incidents of violence in which he was involved, the accounts may be somewhat exaggerated. Came home after work on Friday to find someone had broken in and was sleeping in my extra bedroom. Took me about 15 minutes to wake him up. He woke up trying to tell me this was his house. I hurt him pretty bad, dragged him to the sidewalk and called local law. They arrested me for assault. Went to jail, told them what happened. They dropped charges against me and charged him. Still cost me $400 to get out. I was locked up for 13 and a half years because I assaulted a prison guard and a cop. Never imagined it would be so difficult coming back out here. I'm a good guy, just made some mistakes. The world holds it against me. James Brian Chadwell's brother, Ashley Chadwell, 40, said Chadwell has a history of drunk driving and violence. He once shoved his wife Sarah so violently into the wall that it left a whole body imprint. He also injured one boy by driving around a campsite at high speed while drunk, he said. James Brian Chadwell shared numerous posts and photos showing he had an affinity for the woods and outdoors, as well as a picture of a railroad bridge. In a June 2020 post he wrote, sleeping under a bridge for a while till work starts, the bridge is only six minutes from work, be thankful for the little things. Liquor theft followed by a foot pursuit in Peru, Indiana, lands James Chadwell in jail on January 2, 2020. While on patrol on Monday night at 9.30, Trooper Baldwin was traveling on Main Street near Jefferson Street in Peru, when Miami County dispatched a theft that had occurred from a liquor store within two blocks of Trooper Baldwin's location. A short time later, Trooper Baldwin located James Chadwell walking northbound across Main Street in front of his police vehicle that matched the physical and clothing description from the theft dispatch. Trooper Baldwin used his vehicle spotlight to illuminate James Chadwell at which time Chadwell fled westbound on Main Street. Trooper Baldwin exited his police vehicle and began running after Chadwell while giving loud verbal commands for Chadwell to stop running. James Chadwell surrendered and was taken into custody after a successful jump over a fence ended with an unsuccessful landing. James Chadwell, 40, of Peru, Indiana, had a Bottle of Disarano Amaretto liquor located in the left sleeve of his coat. After being read his Miranda warning, Mr. Chadwell admitted to stealing the bottle of liquor from the liquor store. Trooper Baldwin assisted by officers from the Peru Police Department transported Mr. Chadwell to the Miami County Jail on misdemeanor charges of theft and resisting law enforcement. In 2017 James Brian Chadwell lived in Kokomo, as an autoworker and welder, 
it is likely that he worked at Chrysler Transmission in Kokomo and met Tony Klein there who then would have introduced him to his son if he learned about Chadwell's sadistic fetophile interests. Most likely James Brian Chadwell didn't participate in the actual murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German, but he may have been part of the group of pedophile ring members who contributed in the preparations and in the facilitation of the murders of Libby and Abby. As a member of the inner circle of the pedophile ring, he would have access to Anthony Schott's profile and then be able to communicate with Libby and see pictures of her. It may be in context of the pedophile ring celebration of the murders of Abby and Libby that he had a tattoo commissioned on his arm of a girl's face who looks like a crying Libby. When James Brian Chadwell was brought into the courtroom in Lafayette to receive his guilty verdict, he was asked if he had killed Abby in Libby and to that he clearly answered no, but he was not asked if he was a friend of Keegan and Tony Klein and if he was involved in a pedophilia ring administered by them, nor has he been asked if he was a friend of Richard Allen and Ronald Logan. The case of Bill and Peggy Stevenson murders in Florence, Kentucky, now points to a specific person with a specific item that links it to the Delphi murders of Abby and Libby, Kentucky detectives visited this person in northern Indiana after he was willing to talk to them, they are working with the Indiana police in this case. The Kentucky police said that Richard Allen was not suspected of involvement in this case but other people linked to the murders of Abby and Libby were. May these others include father and son Klein. On May 29, 2011 the Stevenson 74, were brutally bludgeoned and stabbed to death inside their Florence home. Their daughter Beth Stevenson Victor said they were open and friendly and very involved with the church that they went to for years, her father was a deacon and the mother played the organ. The killer or killers also seemed comfortable in the environment, staying hours after the couple was killed to inflict a post-mortem injury on one of them and stage the scene. There also was a message left, though investigators wouldn't share the details, easy to fence items robbers steal were left untouched but photos were arranged to suggest that certain people were liked and others disliked. On July 26, 2016 in Rochester, Indiana, a Miami County man was arrested after he tried to have sexual relations with an underage girl. Earlier in July, the Fulton County Sheriff's Office was contacted by a parent concerning an adult male having inappropriate conversations with her underage daughter. The man was identified as Dwayne Wegner 29, of Peru, Indiana. Wegner continued to communicate with the girl even after learning of her age and the messages also continued to be explicit in nature. An investigation was opened and a detective posing as the 13-year-old girl continued discussions with Wegner on social media. He eventually agreed to meet the girl for sex at a hotel. But on July 22, when Wegner drove to Rochester to meet the young girl, all he found was law enforcement. He was arrested without incident in the Walmart parking lot by the Fulton County Sheriff's Office and the Rochester Police Department. Fulton County Sheriff Christopher Saylors said parents need to monitor children's internet activities. He commended this parent for recognizing the dangers of online messaging and social media and contacting his department when the problem was identified. Wegner was taken to the Fulton County Jail. He faced charges of attempted child molesting, child solicitation and dissemination of material harmful to a child. His bond was set at $75,000. Dwayne G. Wegner, last known address, 613 S. Clinton Boulevard, Bunker Hill, Indiana 46914. Age 35, brown eyes, brown hair, height 5 feet 11 inches, weight 210 pounds. 
convicted on November 22, 2017 of child enticing to six years in prison of which three years were suspended. In March 2022, Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force investigators with the Kokomo Police Department assisted with an investigation initiated by Peru Police Department investigators. Further assistance was requested to Homeland Security Investigators, HSI, in relation to the production and possession of child pornography. On April 22, HSI obtained a signed federal arrest warrant for James Dustin Eugene Rippey, 38, of Peru, charging him for the production and possession of child pornography. Investigators from the Kokomo Police Department assisted Peru Police Department investigators and HSI in serving the warrant. Rippy was taken into custody without incident. This case remains under investigation. Peru, Indiana, the Huntington tourist Joseph Zeti on a Miami County camping trip in July 2021, had inappropriate contact with two juveniles who were 9 and 17 at the time of the incident. Joseph Zeti 31, who is under arrest, was on September 30, 2022 charged with child molesting, sexual performance harmful to minors and sexual performance before a minor that is harmful to minors. The charges stem from an investigation that began in August after the victim's father alerted the authorities of the incident. It's unclear what relationship if any ZT has to the two victims, but the nine-year-old recalled the day in question in an interview with police back in August. During her interview the nine-year-old stated that her brother and she were playing cards with Zeti inside a tent at Honey Bear Hollow Campground in Peru, Miami County. The girl also told police that her parents were with them at the campsite, though they were inside another tent when the alleged incident occurred. At some point in time the conversation with Zeti turned sexual according to the girl's interview and Zeti asked the girl to show him her breasts, the girl refused to do so, Zeti then put his hand under the girl's shirt and rubbed her breasts. In a separate interview, police also spoke with the 17-year-old involved in the incident, who stated that Zeti began making nudity dares while the three were playing cards, which escalated to sexual act dares with his younger sister and him according to court documents. The boy also told police that Zeti and him engaged in oral sex though the boy did not want to. Zeti reportedly denied these allegations in early September, though he later admitted that he did engage in sexual acts with the 17-year-old. However Zeti still denied having any alleged sexual contact with the 9-year-old. Zeti is being held at the Miami County Jail and has a pretrial conference on November 17 inside Miami Circuit Court. Kevin Brown was arrested on May 9, 2017 by police in Miami County after an investigation that started with a tip from the Department of Child Services that a 12-year-old girl had been molested by him. On January 21, 2016 in Peru, Indiana Larry Owen was arrested on preliminary charges of possession of child pornography and child exploration, according to Indiana State Police. ISP and the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force arrested 61-year-old Larry Owen on warrant for 25 counts of possession of child porn. Police began their investigation when they found that Owen might be in possession of inappropriate images of children. Owen's home was searched and investigators found evidence of child porn at the home. Owen was booked in the Miami County Jail, he was later released on bond. On October 21, 2020, Marshall Olin Palmer, 43 from the unincorporated community of Lucerne, was booked into the Cass County Jail on a warrant for sexual battery of a child by Cass County Sheriff's Department. Marshall Olin Palmer, last known address. 3363W200N, Peru, Indiana 46970. Age 45, brown eyes, height 5 feet 10 inches, black hair, weight 230 pounds. Convicted of sexual misconduct with a minor on September 21, 2021. Mason Zimmer, a 28-year-old teacher at Peru Junior High School in Peru, Indiana was arrested on September 5, 2018 for child seduction after having sex with a 16-year-old female student. Police learned about the crime from the girl's mother. Police say sexual images were shared between the two on Snapchat. Detectives say Zimmer confessed to having sex with the student.
Mason Zimmer pleaded guilty to child seduction and was sentenced to three years, including one year in the Department of Corrections and two years suspended. Mason Zimmer is now registered as a sex offender, his last known address is, 90 Albert Street, Peru, Indiana 46970. The late Judge David Clay Cates also ruled in another child sex crime case involving a Claypool woman. On November 8, 2019 in Warsaw, Indiana, a Claypool woman arrested in January on charges of child pornography and taken to the Kosciuszko County Jail, was sentenced to five years in prison in Kosciuszko Superior Court I Thursday, November 7. Rosalind Beatrice Burkhardt, 39, of 107 North Rebecca Street, Claypool, pleaded guilty to two counts of possession of child pornography, level 5 felonies. In September 2018, an Indiana state police officer received information from the National Center for Missing and exploited children through Facebook of child pornography that was uploaded in June. According to the Affidavit of Probable Cause, the officer found that child pornography had been obtained by someone at 107 North Rebecca Street, Claypool. The pornography involved children under the age of 12 and included photos of sexual conduct while in bondage and sexual photos involving bestiality. On January 17, the officer served the search warrant to a man and woman at the residence. The woman was identified as Burkhart. Through interviews, the officer determined that the pornography was on Burkhart's device. Officers searched Burkhardt's cell phone and found child pornography. Burkhardt admitted that she downloaded the items from the internet to her husband's kick account. She then sent the downloaded images to her cell phone by using her husband's Facebook Messenger and sent the images to her Facebook Messenger and her devices. Chief Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Brad Voles described the crimes Burkhardt is charged with as repulsive and nauseating. Burkhart's initial charges included two counts of child exploitation, level 4 felonies. Further investigation, Bowles explained, showed that Burkhart did not create or disseminate the pornography but rather downloaded the photos to her devices for her own viewing. She pleaded guilty to the crimes she committed, Bowles said. She was not guilty of counts 1 and 2. Burkhart's attorney, Doug Lemon, pointed out that. Said to Burkhart. You knowingly possessed a photograph of a child victim forced to engage in bestiality. Kate said Burkhart continued to engage in illegal conduct after her plea. What you've done here is simply not acceptable, Kate said. Kate sentenced Burkhart to five years at the Indiana Department of Corrections. He suspended two years of that sentence and ordered the suspended portion of the sentence to be served on formal probation. You will continue counseling to deal with a sick addiction, Cates ordered. Burkhart was ordered to register as a sex offender and to comply with all sex offender rules. She was given three days of jail time credit and ordered to provide passwords to any online accounts to the probation department. As Burkhart was being led from the courtroom, she could be heard sobbing, I am not gonna be okay. I'm not gonna be okay. On April 30, 2020 in Warsaw, Indiana, a Warsaw woman received a suspended prison sentence for a child seduction case involving a foreign exchange student. Stephanie Lynn Emery, 31, of 975 Logan Street, Warsaw, was charged with child seduction, a level 5 felony. A possession of child pornography charge was dismissed as part of a plea agreement. Emery was sentenced in Kosciuszko Superior Court 1 on Thursday, April 30. On June 12, 2019, the Warsaw Police Department was notified of an inappropriate relationship between a foreign exchange student from Denmark and a member of the host family in Warsaw. At the time officers and investigators were informed, it was realized the student was preparing to ultimately leave the country. Officers located the student at a Warsaw residence as he was preparing to leave with staff members from the exchange company. Emery was also present at that time. The investigation revealed that sexual intercourse between the student and Emery occurred multiple times in a short period of time. In this case, Emery is considered a custodian per state statute who resided with the student and was responsible for his welfare during the time the student was in the foreign exchange program. Ultimately, 
the student was returned to the care of his parents in order to prepare for a flight back to their country. She was in a parental position and she breached that trust, said Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Brad Voles. He came here to study but ended up learning. Something entirely different. She not only breached the victim's trust, but his parents as well. Defense attorney John Barrett said Emery has been seeing a counselor since the incident occurred. I regret the choice I made, said Emery. Judge David Clay Cates sentenced Emery to three years in the Indiana Department of Correction. The sentence was suspended on probation. A no-contact order between Emery and the student is in place. Emery is not allowed to have unsupervised contact with anyone under the age of 18. I've read your statements and letters to the court, said Cates. You don't get it. You don't get it at all. All of this is your responsibility. Judge David Clay Cates died at his home in Syracuse, Indiana from a heart attack on Wednesday, December 9, 2020 at the age of 61, he was born on October 8, 1959 in Evansville, Indiana. Stephanie Lynn Emery, last known addresses, 9458 South Amanda Drive, Claypool, Indiana 46510 and 221 West Main Street, Warsaw, Indiana 46580. Age 33, gray eyes, blonde hair, height 5 feet 3 inches, weight 120 pounds. Convicted of child seduction on April 30, 2020. On August 3, 2021 two teenage boys came to Indiana State Police Detective Josh Mahler with a horrifying story. The boys told Detective Mahler that from 2012 to 2017, they had been molested on multiple occasions by Thomas Brockway in Miami County. The investigation led to the arrest of 64-year-old Brockway on August 6, 2021, who currently lived in Alma, Michigan, but prior lived in Miami County. Now Brockway was back in Miami County, shacked up in the Miami County Jail, charged with two counts of child molestation awaiting his trial. Kokomo, Indiana, on May 22, 2019 a 35-year-old Kokomo man Thomas Robert Huffman faced 10 counts of child molestation after police say he sexually assaulted a 13-year-old juvenile female multiple times over an eight-month period. Six of those counts were level one felonies, and the remaining four were level four. Thomas Robert Huffman was taken into custody without incident Saturday at his residence in the 2700 block of North Washington Street to be held at the Howard County Jail on $75,000 cash bond. With 10% required to bond out. Earlier this month, the 13-year-old met with a Department of Child Services employee after she researched how to tell a parent about being sexually assaulted and had written her mother a letter describing the incidents. In the interview with DCS, the girl said that Huffman would rub her genitalia and perform various sexual acts on her while she pretended to be asleep, a probable cause affidavit filed through Howard County Superior Court once stated. With those incidents each lasting a few minutes at a time. The juvenile also stated in her interview that the incidents began in June 2018 and lasted through the end of March 2019, court records noted. Huffman had an initial hearing at 9 a.m. Monday, June 3, in Howard Superior Court 1. Late on Monday morning in February 11, 2020 a criminal investigation by Indiana State Police Detective Wendell Beachy resulted in the arrest of 25-year-old Titan James Kaiser from Macy in Miami County on two felony charges for child molestation. Indiana State Police Trooper John Cole and Detective Beachy served Kaiser with a Miami Circuit Court arrest warrant. Kaiser was incarcerated in the Miami County Jail. In June 2019, Detective Beachy started an investigation after receiving information that a 12-year-old girl had been molested at a Miami County home on June 22, 2019. During the course of the investigation, evidence indicated that Kaiser had committed sexual acts on the then 12-year-old girl.